I, I've said this many times, Eric has changed my life. I was 100% committed to art blocks blindly because of him. I give him full, I mean, I, I obviously allocated the ETH and I showed a commitment on a, on a high level, but it was 100%, not because I knew anything about generative art. It was because of Eric that I minted so many squiggles and spent so much time in art blocks. Welcome to the SquiggleDAO podcast. I'm Nifty. I'm leading a finance acquisitions and NFT DeFi for the DAO. And I'm Jared underscore pause, founder of the 8NAP Digital Asset Fund, the generative art platform 8NAP, and an unwavering lover of the Chromi Squiggle. Today, we have the pleasure of talking with the one and only Von Mises. He has had a career in traditional finance, been early to crypto, early to NFTs, and able to see the potential of technologies in advance of most. For NFTs, he was early to punks, early to art blocks, and specific to today's discussions, early to squiggles. You've had over 110 punks at one time, bought 60 punks within your first 30 days of discovery. You have a full art blocks curated series one through eight set, and we will discuss your squiggle conviction in just a little bit. You're a steward of the space, mentor to many, and generous beyond comprehension with your time. Uh, it, it has been a pleasure to have you here today. So welcome. And how are you today, Vaughn? Good. Thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. I, I was, it was funny. I was scrolling through the Discord before I saw that, you know, our, our first conversation back in Feb, February of 2022, and you were just learning about squiggles and you reached out to me and it was cool because like, I'm very hesitant when people reach out to me, you know, unprompted, but you asked a lot of the right questions immediately. I knew you were someone who was into it. So I was happy to engage with you and I'm glad that we're here today. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just randomly through the proof discord got a recommendation to reach out to some guy named Von Mises. Uh, and it absolutely was one of the best uh, decisions within uh, the web three space. And it's actually one of the points when I give conviction to telling people just to DM anybody because you never know what will happen. Uh, it's one of my core theses and, and our interaction is the basis of that. It's It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. So let's. Let's start with your journey into crypto and NFTs. Uh, how long or how did you find crypto? And as a lifelong collector, you know, NFTs may have been intuitive to be intuitive to you, but what gave you the conviction to make your first purchase? So I got into uh, Bitcoin in 2011, uh, having been a financial markets nerd. I, I remember one night just reading an article about Bitcoin and immediately being hooked. Uh, within a week of that article, I had bought my first Bitcoin through uh, Mt. Gox, the now defunct and infamous exchange. Uh, and that you know, led me on this crypto journey. That, that article I read was really life changing at the time. Uh, but, Obviously, I couldn't have known that, but you know, with the benefit of hindsight, it really did change my life. Uh, yes, I've always collected different things, um, been into various collectibles. Uh, when I got into NFTs, it combined three things that I was very passionate about in my life, which was collecting, trading, and crypto. Uh, and although Gods Unchained was the first NFT I purchased, I really felt like when I got to CryptoPunks, everything kind of coalesced that I had been spending my life doing. Like I immediately, when I looked at CryptoPunks, I was like, this is for me. This is something I'm extremely interested in. And I felt really strongly it was one of the best collectibles that I had ever come across. Uh, and I didn't necessarily expect the, the rise to be so quickly and so meteoric, but I absolutely, was very, very, very confident that what I was looking at was something special and that the gains would be apparent. And uh, ultimately, these were, you know, um, transformational technology and getting more involved in NFTs just was very, very easy for me. It, it Having been involved in blockchain since 2011, I, you know, it was, I was very comfortable taking on this and recognizing that from a risk return standpoint, this was a very, very positive, positive place to be. Yeah, it's been fun to watch you go back through uh, the, what I assume is the Punks Discord and kind of screenshot some of your 
your conviction plays uh, and, and really capture those moments about that foresight. It's, uh, I forget what, what organization you're doing that for, but it's just, as you're sharing those tweets, it, it just is a reaffirmation of, you know, some of the stuff we'll get into um, later on about you being able to look around corners. I mean, just those screenshots are just such a really cool part of, of history and appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have, I've never felt as convicted as I felt about punks and yeah, the, the conviction I was doing it for Yuga. Yuga is doing like a, asking some key people that were involved in punks early to screenshot some of their discord conversations and messages and then i upload like 30 or 40 um different screenshots and i'm just like really really was really convicted on it so when i look back at it i'm like wow that was some of the stuff i was saying was just like i i don't know how i was that convinced but i was super convinced we just saw some of the comments and those were let me tell you visionary level comments because you were saying very early everything that happened quickly afterwards so yeah next time we'll we'll pay more attention <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> a quick question sure. as, as a way of introducing you know that you you're wearing your as most people know you're wearing your 1111 profile picture that's as everyone knows a, a peak spike hair and a shadow bird punk maybe not everyone has noticed that it's also wearing a silver chain and wanted to ask you why did you choose that one did the id had something to do with you choosing that as your pfp uh you know it's it's kind of interesting i had rotated a couple different punks as my profile picture in the beginning i had been sporting a cowboy punk for a while that i still have that i really like uh and then this one came along and I don't know, I just kind of vibe with it. Like, I think it kind of looks like me a little bit. And no, I don't ever wear a silver chain, but I thought the silver chain added an element of rarity to it. So I was like, you know, this is nowhere near my rarest or most desirable or most valuable punk, but I really felt like this is the punk that really was me. And so I started using it and I just liked it and I don't think I could ever change it. So I'm um, this is this is me. This is Vaughn. It's funny because eleven eleven uh, has a, a you know a bit of luck connotation to to some people. You know, it's like make a wish when the clock turns to eleven eleven. So, interestingly, I bought it. I bought this punk for one point one 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 ETH. Shut up! Well, no, that's seriously. impressive. This is like the uh, guy listed it. The guy listed it for like one point five ETH. TJ is his name. He's still around. And um, I showed him a 1.111 ETH bid, and he said, okay. And then he, I actually paid him even more for the V1. I have the V1 punk of this one as well. Oh, how funny is that? So you paid more for the V1 than yeah. the V2. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. That's hilarious. That's really funny. So we talked about your ability, and we've alluded to it, to, to look around corners. But something that you and I have spoken about, uh, you know, briefly, albeit, but very impactful to me is, is the importance of legacy, legacy, especially when it comes to being a good steward of the space, which I think you're definitely leading by example. And I believe the Squiggle Dow is doing that, you know, for the Squiggle and Eric. So I guess the, the question is, is what principles do you consider essential for creating positive impact that endures? I mean, I think that you know, I think there's a lot of people that are self-serving in the space. And I can't say that, you know, that that's necessarily wrong. Everyone's looking out for themselves. But ultimately, if you are concerned about legacy, helping people that ask for help, people that are there for the right reasons, I think those are really important traits. You know, like our, our story, you reached out randomly. And I remember going back and forth with you quite a bit about squiggles and the finer points of squiggles. And in general, when people ask me, uh, I'm, I'm willing to help. Uh, and I think what's really cool is that when you act in that way and what is relatively speaking a selfless way, you end up creating this following of people that are very loyal to you because when they didn't know a lot, you were very free with your time to help them and get them up to speed. And then a lot of those people go on to, to do great things in the space. Uh, and then, 
you know, it's how you build friendships and how you build allies. And when you help people, when there's nothing in it for you, and you're just helping them because you want to advance the space and move the ball forward, those people will be respectful of you and they will like you because when you didn't, when, when they needed your help, you were willing to help. That reminded me a lot uh, about the snow frost approach as well to inclusivity, being selfless, just helping the community and trying to be a, a, a one good member of the community. And I love that. And I've seen you, Bon, even trying to do it via Twitter publicly when the market maybe it's getting overheated in a meme coin or something, just putting the public service announcement, hey, be careful, there are signs of FOMO, don't, don't fall for it. So that's something that great. Although you receive some some critics, some critics. <laughs> look, I, the thing is, the more hate I get when I put a message out saying "be careful with meme coins," the more sure I am that it's overheated because the people that are acting in their own self interest and uh, they're dependent on keeping the you know the fish on the hook. Of course, they don't want someone like me saying, "Hey, fish, watch out! You're about to get you're about to get eaten." You know, so the I. Even in some of the tweets I'll put out, like especially when I was talking about that Pepic, when like I would say, like, notice how aggressive people are attacking me. This is not what my comments are saying in a sea of bullish comments shouldn't affect anybody. The fact that everyone lashes out tells you how fragile their narrative is. And you know, look, I I think that acting in an ethical and professional way, even if it costs you money, is more important. And I don't think a lot of people understand that in this space. And because a lot of people are acting, you know, in a self-centered, selfish way. And trust me, I'm not here to be, you know, the most, I, I'm not here to not make money. Of course, I'm here to make money also. But in the same sense, it's not worth it to to soil my reputation or to take advantage of a situation. That's just not really what it's about, in my opinion. I love that. And I always say that reputation is worth more than money. So it's totally, I'm totally with you. It's, we are here to make money, but not at any price. So I agree. That's right. It, something super cool that I, it's inspiration and a, as like a big goal for me is something like you've done, we've seen, you sharing your frame with your three punks representing your family. I, I mm. love that idea. I hope one day I can do it. And have you done it with other collections? Are you planning to do it with another collection? Maybe squiggles? <laughs> um, you know, uh, my, my daughter has a squiggle. Also, I gave her a squiggle. Uh, but, you know, like... I did that family portrait and it hangs in my daughter's room because I want her to bond with punks and I want her to grow up around crypto punks. And, and I know that someday, you know, she'll be at school and, or someone will bring up the topic of crypto punks and she's going to be like, Oh, I have a crypto punk. And everyone's going to be like, no, you don't. Or, you know, cause who knows like what these things will be worth someday. And I don't know. I just think it's cool that, she's going to grow up with them and think they're completely normal and have a digital representation of herself. And it'll never, it'll never be strange to her. And I think that one of the things that people need to keep in mind in this space is that a lot of people that are young are going to grow up in a world where they're not going to distinguish between a digital asset and a real world asset. They're just going to be assets or they're not going to distinguish between digital art and real world art. It's all just art. And I think that that's lost on a lot of people. And to me, it's very easy to see that. But, you know, I I told plenty of people, just like I told people about Bitcoin at $5 and nobody listened to me. And I told people about CryptoPunks at 100 bucks and nobody listened to me. You know, it's it's very hard to get people to change their perception of things. You just have to see it, feel confident in your, in your decision, feel confident in why you're making these decisions. And eventually people come around or they don't. But Fortunately for, for, you know, the space we're in, it seems like, you know, more and more people are coming around. And I, I just think it's a matter of time before, you know, MoMA and other big time institutions are, you know, knee deep in digital assets, because of course that's in 50 years or a hundred years, it, it, it's going to be indistinguishable. No, no one's going to say, oh, well, that's a digital asset. I don't care about that. No, no chance, zero chance of that. Yeah. You're, you're, I think spot on when you talk about the transition from, 
digital art to just art. It, it, it's a no brainer to me and how we're moving forward. Yeah. Um, now I want to transition into, you know, the story about you and a relationship with the, the creator of the Chromie squiggle. I, I, you know, I don't think, uh, the importance of Snowfro for generative art and the web three space can be understated. I and mean, he's seriously one of a kind, anybody who's gotten to have any level of interaction with them or engage with them can definitely see, um, just, just what a unique individual, you know, Snowfro is. Um, I, for one, am amazed and in awe at his curiosity and his ability to execute. That's one thing that was very, very apparent to me when I recorded with him last. Uh, is there any specific quality of Snowfro that you found yourself drawn to more than any other? Uh, yeah, I mean, so I met Eric in the CryptoPunks Discord uh, as someone who was very active in the CryptoPunks Discord. You know, there was about 30 of us that were there every day talking about crypto punks and nerding out about them and talking about how, you know, they were going to be super popular someday and in museums and people would see them the way that they're perceived now. And, but the thing about Eric was he was always very um, generous with his time, always willing to help. People would ask questions and he was always answering the questions and explaining you know, difficult concepts relating to blockchain. And, you know, I was like, this is someone that I respect more than anyone else in the space. He was very honest and didn't seem like he had an agenda and not trying to angle shoot anybody, just very, very straightforward guy. And so, you know, he had talked about a lot of different ideas to me and to other people in that were in the CryptoPunks Discord. And the CryptoPunks Discord was the kind of place where while we were all there for CryptoPunks, a lot of us had been early in a lot of different things and were coming up with ideas and talking about things that we were looking at. It was a really amazing place for, for Alpha. So uh, when Eric said to me, hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm starting this platform. It's a generative art platform. And, you know, and couple weeks it's going to launch it's called art blocks and i'd love for you to take a look at it and i was like eric if this is something you feel strongly about and you like it well i'm here and you know i truly did it because i respected eric and i thought that this was somebody that sees things on a level higher than i see them and i know that i'm seeing things you know overall pretty clear been early in a lot of different things so it's like if this is what he likes and this is where he sees things going, okay, I'm there. And so for me, you know, on day one or day zero, I made the commitment that this was something that I wanted to support and, you know, showed my support. And, and I think goes back to what we were saying of acting selflessly and, and Snow putting so many hours as a CryptoPunks Discord mod for free and just trying to help on board people I think makes total sense and that's what's create that that people like you then are, are happy to support when when he launches a project do you have a specific memory when you were impressed with Snowfro or where when you said there is something special with maybe art blocks or his way of thinking I mean just the fact that he was in the CryptoPunks discord every day nerding out with all of us and treating people who were newcomers like myself with respect and not talking down to people ever and always just very positive force. The fact that he had claimed 17 zombies and, you know, it was just a really, really strong positive force. I mean, if you were to go back to early 2020 and look in the CryptoPunks Discord, I mean, he's there every single day. He's there talking. Oh, all, a lot of us were there, but just always very straightforward like never a harsh word never nasty always helpful and just like okay this is someone that i think you know um i want to follow and if this is what he's I, i've said this many times eric has changed my life if it i i was 100 committed to art blocks blindly because of him i give him full i mean i i obviously allocated the eth and I showed a commitment on a on a high level, but it was 100%, not because I knew anything about generative art, it was because of Eric that I minted so many squiggles and spent so much time in art blocks. 
That's incredible. I'm like amazed and I wish so deeply uh, to have been there in the punks discord and, and able to, to see some of those early days. I know it's kind of crazy. I was just looking, Snowfro has, you know, over a hundred thousand followers on Twitter. You know, he's absolutely blown up and it sounds like, you know, for all the right reasons, he's always been there for the community, always been there to, to take the, the higher road. So it's just, it's, it's really impressive to, and it's a testament to his true character that it's been sure. like this from day one, you know? Um, what, so what do you, what do you think Snowfro means to the digital art space and, and, and that to pull on that string of, of legacy, what, what do you think Snowfro's legacy will be, you know, trying to project into the future, obviously? So, you know, I mean, tying it also back to squiggles, as I've always said that the squiggle, you know, obviously, in addition to being, you know, the zero drop on art blocks, as Eric's creation, you know, it's it also is a bet on Eric. And, you know, he's on a crypto godlike projection pr trajectory. I mean, he, not only is he has he created this entirely new genre of long form generative art, like changing the traditional model of what gen art was, but he's an um, ambassador a great ambassador who's out there every day and trying to advance the calling for gen art and really taking it to the next level to where I don't think he's going to only impact gen art and crypto, but he's got the real potential to influence art as a whole and have potentially people talk about him, you know, as a found, you know, as a founder of a movement that goes on to change art, not just, a niche crypto nft like he talks all the time about the fact that at some point in the future no one's going to call nfts nfts they're going to be digital art and anytime you have a piece of digital art of course it's on a blockchain there is no other way to secure it as a piece of digital art so you know he always is talking about the you know the next iteration of where things are going to be so we will we will um evolve past the term nft and will simply refer to digital art as digital art and of course it's on a blockchain of course it, it has a, a token associated with it it's the only way to actually be a piece of digital art yeah i think i look forward to that day uh trying to explain what an, a non-fungible token is to to some of the normie friends is, is a little bit uh it's murky to say the least, but you know Eric's doing incredible work uh, in my opinion. Yes. I'm I'm floored every time I I listen to him or have the the opportunity to speak to him. He's just absolutely incredible. Uh, I mean, every time I see him, I have a hard time not you know wanting to kiss him because like he's impacted my life in a way I just couldn't possibly have imagined. Like eternally grateful. What what you're alluding to is is his impact isn't just finance. I mean, he's impacted my life uh, just from an inspiration and a, a beacon for so many in this space. I mean, he just he absolutely takes that higher road every single time, and mm -hmm. he, he's such a source of inspiration for so many. I, I mean, I'm looking at Nifty's head nodding. I mean, just the the amount of reach he's had is is pretty incredible. If you had one word to describe him which I know is very limiting, but what's the first word that comes to your head to describe snow? Integ integrity, honesty. I mean, all those words would be like, you know, those are words that I, I associate with Eric. I mean, integrity, honesty, you know, sincere, uh, revolutionary, groundbreaking. Like, I mean, those are things, all the things that he's accomplished. I mean, just, just to conceive of something like art blocks and have it all on chain. And just like when he launched when he launched art blocks, he thought of so many things to future proof it when who knew whether it was going to die out in a month, but he was like, I'm not doing this unless it's done right. And I think that's really, you know, speaks volumes for what he's all about. Like it was never going to be about, um, you know, cutting corners. Yeah, if there's a Mount Rushmore for uh, the digital art space, you know, I think the the first person to get chiseled in is is definitely Eric. Uh, it's it's incredible what he's done. I completely agree with that. I totally agree. I and I, it, it was coming to my mind what Warren Buffett always says about you cannot do a good deal with a bad person, 
And here we are at the opposite side of the spectrum. Like with a good person, it's very easy to do a, a good deal or following him to be successful. So uh, one question is, you've mentioned that you were going to fully support Snowfrone, whatever he was launching on, on, on Artblocks. What were your thoughts, your expectations when you were minting um, Squiggles? Uh, you know, I mean, I definitely had people asking me, like, why are you minting so many? Like, <laughs> you know, um, I was kind of like chasing the rares, like trying to like get the hyper rainbows and some of the different just cool variants. And so I looked at it like, it's almost like opening like a, pack, like a pack of baseball cards. Like, you know, most of the time you're going to get nothing. You know, it's going to be very average. But on occasion, you get something really cool that you really wanted. So that was kind of why I was, you know, doing so many of them. I, but, you know, genuinely, I was like, okay, I've got this ETH. And this is a person who's, you know, made a very, very, very strong impression on me. So I should support him on a level that I think I can afford to support him on. And so I'm like, this is his project. And I want to make sure that it has at least the possibility to be as successful as possible. And so I'm going to show my support. I have definitely talked about this before. I mean, I genuinely didn't have a lot of expectations about making money. Did I think that Squiggles would make some money? Yeah, I mean, I thought I would make some money on Squiggles. Um, I thought that it was, you know, anytime you're buying the first drop on a new platform or a new concept, you know, it's a high risk, high return trade. It could have, you know, the platform could have petered out and everything I had spent goes to zero or close to zero. And I accepted that that was possible or even likely. But I also looked at it like, this is someone very smart who has been very forward looking as well. And this is what he believes in. And I'm going to show my support. And if it works out, great. And if it doesn't work out, that's fine also. And it turned out to be the best crypto trade I've ever done. And it's not even close. So, I mean, you were one of the largest uh, day zero mentors. Uh, and as you were clicking that button over and over again, other than trying to find the rares, like what was going through your mind when you just kept minting? Uh, you know, I was, I would mint them. I would mint a batch of like say 20 and then I would, go through them. And I remember sending them to Eric on the first day. Hey, what do you think of this? Oh, that's a really great one. Oh, I love that one. Oh my God, that one's crazy. Like just stuff like that. And then, I don't know, I, my plan was to mint more than I minted, to be honest with you. But I, I figured it after the, you know, after minting a hundred on the first day, I stopped. I had also minted 27 Genesis pieces that day as well. Um, although I arrived I, I think the, the drop started at one o'clock and I didn't get there till two thirty. So the construction token dropped that day had already sold out. So I had to buy my construction tokens in the secondary market. But, you know, I, I felt like I wanted to show my support. And so I, I minted and regularly and often. That's super cool. I love the idea of just minting and, and sharing what's coming out of that pack of cards. With, yeah. with Snowfro, I love that. And and you were minting in batches or how were you doing specifically? Like because there was no when... batch, it was just literally one at a time. So it was click, click, mint, click, mint, click, mint, click, mint, click. That's yeah. incredible. That's incredible. And it was cool watching them pop up. I mean, you know, I enjoyed it, but like, you know, you'd get a, a fuzzy or a bold and you'd be like, that's not what I wanted, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you got two consecutive hypers. I, I when you were saying it, I was thinking, wow, that's Amazing. Well, it wasn't on the first day, but yes, later, later on. So, right. So I minted the hundred the first day and then, you know, uh, there was still obviously that there was 10,000 to mint out. So over the course of the next, um, you know, couple of months when I would get some extra ETH, I'd go mint another 20 or I'd mint another 50 or I'd mint, you know, I just mint, 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 mint. And it was fun. I liked it. It was, it was, like I said, it was like opening up packs of baseball cards and you never knew what you were going to get. And, um, you know, I felt like it was something I wanted to do. So a, a fun story. And I still think that we are really fortunate that we can live while squiggles are still minting. I think we are living part of history. So that's super cool. Yeah.
Yep. Yeah, whereas I was just happy to get a Venus over Manhattan Mint and to be able to mint one. I, I love Vaughn's story that that mint is still his most expensive. <laughs> it's the most expensive squiggle I ever bought <laughs> by a lot. <laughs> it, it's so mind blowing to me, but it, it's it's just a it's a testament to the the vision that you had, and I, I really do appreciate you sharing this because not only were you an early adopter and and supporter of of Snow, but you know what what I was really impressed with and i think that this has served as a big source of inspiration for for nifty and i and for those who aren't necessarily familiar you were one of the early explorers of the squiggle algorithm and and some of your discoveries have you know led others to to dig deeper into the algorithm also can you just share briefly uh what you what was going through your mind when you really brought to light the the concept of a full spectrum and perfect spectrum yeah, sure. I, I want to, before we get into this, I just want to say that on this topic, I, you know, I made a very small contribution to Squiggles and in no way, shape or form does it, I, I don't want to take anything away from er, anything that Eric's done. I was just um, an interested collector who spent some time digging into Squiggles and asking a lot of questions. And this was something that I brought to him that then ultimately became a reality. So <clears throat> Having minted a lot of squiggles, I started looking at them and I thought the color, obviously squiggles is all about color. And uh, I started asking Eric more about how the colors were derived and trying to understand what goes into the actual output of a squiggle. And, you know, fortunately he was very uh, willing to talk to me about it. I mean, I just have pages and pages and pages and pages of Discord messages back and forth from like the end of November, you know, going forward, end of November 2020 going forward, because we were just constantly talking about squiggles and constantly talking about what goes into the algorithm and, and how the outputs are created. So I said to him, I remember saying, hey, you know, this is kind of interesting. There's this one combination of color spread and segments and steps that that gives you this you know every single color hue and i was like you know i think that given that squiggles is all about color i think that this is something that you know is, is kind of significant i said i don't know if you this was intentional but the bottom line is it, you do have one where every single color hue is displayed exactly once and i said you know i, I think that it might be helpful to give some designations to you know floor squiggles base squiggles so that when people get a base squiggle there's something a little bit extra to go for something a little bit extra to think about and just to be clear this is about three or four days after the squiggle drop started so this is like the first day of the first couple of days of december of 2020 um and eric said yeah i think this is really interesting i think this is something that we should do uh, he said, uh, he said, do you have any idea, you know, how rare this is or what expectations or something along that line? I said, well, there's probably not going to be that many because I do think it's pretty rare to only have this one combination. And then he said something like, well, is there something else we can do to expand it a little bit more? And I said, well, you know, maybe we could do perfect spectrum and full spectrum and the full spectrum will be very similar, you know, to where you can't tell with the naked eye, but it's statistically not quite as rare. And we settled on this 1% uh vari variance from perfect and interestingly it only made two combinations so that meant there would be twice as many full spectrums as perfect spectrum so then from a rarity standpoint it kind of it kind of lined up just right also and you know a couple of days later it was implemented and that's the story of of it that's an incredible story that uh, as jared was saying that has inspired both of us to do the research and have so much fun with the data the collection and, and digging deeper. So th thank you for, for that inspiration. And have you done something similar for other collections? Uh, you know, I've always, I mean, I dig into a lot of the early stuff quite a bit, um, but, but very few had the depth that something like Swiggles had when, you know, when you have uh, an algorithm that's intended to create 10,000, you know, you, you can tease out some very, rare, some very rare concepts when you have so, so many iterations of it. But uh, yeah, I, 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 
I thought it was interesting to see, you know, all the colors in a squiggle and just made my case. I, I love that. And, and something that I think makes squiggles really special and gives squiggles a lot of depth is that Snowflow was fine tuning that algorithm for two years. We saw pictures of him sharing squiggles, those spaghetti squiggles in, in 20, 2018, I think. So it's around two, two and a half years working on an algorithm. And I think that's, of course, shows when, when the collection is so deep and so special. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a testament to, to the to the breadth of the collection when when you know over time all of us are allowed to collect around specific aspects of the algorithm that maybe don't show up in the metadata. Obviously recently has been the you know the I'll call it it's been highlighted the the concept of a harmonic amongst mm -hmm. a, a ribbed. By the way, I was going through your, your vault here, Vaughn. Do you have a, is that a true ghost squiggle in your art blog or the ghost in it's your, not uh... quite. it's not quite, ah. it's not quite, it's close, but it's not quite, uh, it would, I mean, I think that like, you know, for, to be a true harmonic, it has to be the exact color hue, uh, of the underlying where for ghosts, I think the definition is a little bit wider. I think that most people would call that a ghost squiggle because the, 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 the cat, it, it's not a harmonic ghost, but it's a ghost. Yeah, and for anybody listening, Squiggle three nine eight. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. It's uh, I, for one, am not ribbed aren't at the the top of my my favorite list. I'm a little bit of a bowl guy, but this one has a really really cool open terminal at the end with a red dot. So and it just it blends in with the background uh, pretty well. So that that was one that always stood out to me in your collection. I do remember when I minted that. I remember sending it to Snow, and he's like, "Wow, that's a cool one. I like that one a lot." I remember that for sure. I, I, those ghosts are, are crazy cool. And, and in line with what you were saying, we were doing a, lo a little bit of work around ghosts to try to define specifically those. Because, mm -hmm. of course, perfect whites are going to be ghosts. Right. There are just four right now. But talking with Snowfro, he was saying that if, if you are within two, three color hues of the specific color, you cannot even see, even zooming in into the image, it's really difficult to see the difference. So maybe right. defining ghosts as within three color hues and including those perfect whites that are, of course, the pure uh, right. harmonic ghost. But we were in that line, so probably we'll share something soon. Nice. You you mentioned that uh, you sent it to, to Eric and got his reaction. When you were minting, is there any other fun stories that come to mind for, for Eric and his reaction to some of your stuff? Uh, well, you know, one of, uh, I, I did mint a hyper bold on the first day and I remember sending it to him. He's like, Eric was like, holy shit. He's like, that's an, that's an, that's an alien basically. And I was like, really? No, I will tell you this. <clears throat> I did fumble that one. So, uh, this is one of my biggest regrets in squiggles. Uh, but in, in January, it was either January or February of 2021. Uh, I sold it to Akira uh, in a weak moment, uh, I sold it for 20 ETH, but at the time it was more than I had spent on all my art blocks combined. So I was like, okay, this is one squiggle that I minted and I can recover everything I've ever spent on art blocks and I get to keep everything else for free. And, and so while I have regrets looking back on that and I wish I hadn't sold it, uh, in the same sense, uh, you know, nobody ever lost money taking a profit is a saying I like to use. And so yeah. if you can basically mon take out every penny you ever put into an entire project with one sale while keeping the 500 other mints that you have, I, you know, without the, with the benefit of hindsight, I wouldn't have done it, but in a fluid market where you never know what the future holds, sometimes taking your money out of the trade is not a bad trade. Well, you, you still have a hyper fuzzy in there, so I think you're I do. doing all right overall. Yes. And, and of course, I always like to mention that when with the information you had at the time was the sensible decision. So no, in markets, you do a lot of those decisions and no regrets afterwards because that's pretty, pretty dangerous. Yeah, I've right. always admired that uh, hyper bold in Akira's wallet. I didn't realize that was uh, that was yours. Yeah. Yeah, I meant it. I went to, actually, I offered it to Snowfro first. He actually talked about it a while ago. He said to me, I remember 
Von Mises is contacting me about uh, about a, um, a hyperbold and he passed on it because he'd been buying so much art blocks and he was like, I, I, you know, I, I can't be, you know, it's funny to think that Snowfro now would not would pass on something that was 20 ETH, but at the time, like it was, 20 ETH was a lot in, in January or February of 2021. It was not what, there was very few things in art blocks that was even possible to trade at that level. So, you know, it's, it's just, he regrets not buying it, but ultimately, you know, I'm, I'm very friendly with Akira and we've done a lot of things together. So I'm glad he has it. Although I do regret selling it and he likes to bust my balls about it. <laughs> Rightfully so. No, I, I agree with you. You got to, if I were presented with the same opportunity to cover all my investments with one sale, it's, uh, you know, it's tough to pass up on that. Um, but it's, it's definitely, definitely in hindsight, a, a tough pill to swallow. Yeah. Um, Lastly, we want to kind of transition into more of a rapid fire section here. Uh, Nifty will lead it off. So please feel free to give as much or as little detail uh, in your responses as you see fit. Yeah. So we have 10 rapid fire questions. No need to be a rapid fire answer as we are coming to a close. First one is what are you most excited about right now in the space? I mean, I'm excited for the next bull market to start. I can tell you that. I've had enough of two years. I've, I've, the last two years uh, has been challenging. Uh, it doesn't shake my my faith. I mean, one thing I, I always have, have preached is you, you don't change your views based on price action. You only change your views if there's been new information or the information you had has changed. And nothing has changed in the story. Uh, we probably got a little ahead of ourselves. Uh, we've been, been through a correction and but I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, the technology and what what it what blockchain and nfts give to the world is the story is unchanged so I'm excited for the next round of people to understand what's going on here and and uh, you know see some more people come back into this space love that agree looking forward to the next pool as well and and the the thesis is intact so we are still Correct. here any grails you've mentioned the hyperbolt that you sold to Akira for 20 ETH. Mm -hmm. any grails that got away or that you missed buying and the story behind those you know I I, uh, I I passed on an ape crypto punk for about 30 ETH at the time that was only about six thousand uh, dollars I'm you know I have regrets about about passing that up on that one, but I just bought my zombie punk uh, about a couple of days earlier and I've been on this crazy acquisition spree. So I was like, you know, I've just back off. I mean, I, it was, it's kind of weird because when I was buying all these punks, you know, as I'm buying them, the prices are moving up and I'm like, am I, am I causing this? Like, is, is it my money that's doing this? And am I the sucker? Like, all these OGs are going to dump on me because I'm the idiot. Like I literally thought that. And so I was like, <clears throat> okay, well, you just bought a zombie. They tested you there. Now here's an ape. They're like seeing if you're going to go 30 ETH on this ape. They're like, they're going to see how big of a sucker I was. That's literally what I was thinking. So I'm like, I'm going to let this one go and just see what happens. So I regret that. Do you still hold the zombie, right? I still have the zombie. That's, yeah, that's good. So... Other than your PFP 1111, what would be the last NFT that you would hold on to? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, you know, I would say that uh, like one of the perfect, I have, I have two perfect spectrum swingles left. Uh, I would say the one's a ribbed, which is the first one minted on the first day. I That would be hard to sell. The other one I like more visually, it's probably the most eye pleasing squiggle um, perfect spectrum in my opinion it's just got a beautiful like mountain like shape and uh so I, I would say that would probably be the last nft i would i would probably sell because like i feel like i helped create the category uh it has a very important place in my collection so i would i would say that probably the uh, i think it's number 463 Perfect Spectrum Squiggle would probably be the last NFT I would sell. Yeah, I was just going to mention, for anybody listening, it is 463, and it has a really cool shape to it. I remember showing that one to Eric, and he's like, he's, he loved the, he, he always liked the form of that one. Yeah. I was expecting maybe a mention to Nessie, 
but <laughs> Nessie's up there. Nessie's up there. I mean, she's pretty cool, but I didn't mint her. She's the only swizzle in my collection that I didn't mint. I bought that secondary. So one of the things that I w- w- was always doing is when the minter was going, you know, you'd see the squiggles pop up. You'd see the squiggles pop up. And if I saw something interesting, I'd always reach out and say, hey, you know, I see you just minted this squiggle. Any interest in selling it? And, you know, I know G Money likes to talk about the first interaction I had with him was like 10 minutes after he minted the squiggle, he got a message from me. He thought that was really funny. Um, and, you know, we're, we're very friendly. I obviously having been in the space together for a long time. But, you know, I, I probably sent hundreds of messages like that and very few worked out. But occasionally you'd get someone who would come back to you and say, hey, you know, I am interested in selling it. And so Nessie, the hyper fuzzy, is the one squiggle in my collection that I did not mint. That's a fun fact. Literally the only squiggle that you did not mint? In my collection, yes. Wow. So I have two squiggles hanging on my walls, and I think that creates a special connection with the art when you are enjoying them in your day-to-day activities, even during the weekends, I see them. Do you have, besides the frame with your three family punks, do you have any other NFTs or non-NFTs pieces of art hanging on your walls? Uh, Yeah, I have three Fidenzas uh, hanging in my living room. They're all, they're framed together. Um, Beautiful. I, I I have a pretty traditional old colonial home. So seeing this modern you know, colorful gen art is kind of a good um, juxtaposition, I guess, to use an art term of of imagery and really looks good in the living room. Uh, I have a QQL that I just got that I hung in my daughter's room also. Again, I'm trying to really cement her appreciation for the art, even though she's very young, she likes it. It's a kind of a whimsical QQL. Uh, so it looks really nice in her room. I have uh, I have a Zancan garden monolith hanging. Uh, and then uh, through my uh, love of gen art, I was able to meet Manfred Moore, whose studio is in New York City, and he's a very OG uh, generative artist. I uh, started doing computer art in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and uh, from what I understand, actually coined the term generative art, uh, where the term before was computer art or computer-aided art or whatever. So I I believe that Manfred Moore is attributed with um, creating that term. So I have a very early Manfred Moore piece that's framed and hangs in my bedroom. Uh, This was one of his first iterations with cubes, and if you're a fan of Manfred Moore, you know that the cube and its various rotations and dissecting goes on to be kind of his signature uh, style. And so having a very, very early piece, one of his first iterations of the cube, to me, is a very interesting and cool piece to have. That's really cool. You've essentially covered some of the the history for generative art to, to go from, you know, I'll call it uh, pre-blockchain to to post-blockchain. So it's cool that you're able to to capture that amongst your house and be able to share that with anybody who visits. I got to ask though, one of those Fidenzas has to be the spiral. Is that not correct? Yeah, the spiral's there. It's the um, the three that I have hanging next to each other. It's the spiral, uh, and then I have um, a cool palette super blocks uh, Fidenza, and then I have the Jumbo XL. Uh, Fidenza. Also, I mean, I can the numbers. I can give you the numbers if you're curious. Yeah, the spiral is. I have your collection up, maybe on a different screen here, but the spiral is five ninety two for anybody looking. I think it's one of the best spirals out there. It's just, it's got uh, a beautiful, beautiful like soft touch to it. It, it in 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 the classic color, you know, Fidenza coloring. So it's it's gorgeous. One. I think it's the best spiral. Yeah. Thank you. The uh, the the cool. The cool palette super blocks is number nine one seven, and then the jumbo XL is seven nine eight, and I think the three of them together give a nice cross section of kind of what the algorithm is capable of, and uh, they look well. They look good together, and um, you know I, I enjoy having them in my house. The I, I wish I had a uh, micro. That's the one thing that I feel like I'm missing from my collection 
Um, but overall, I'm happy with the fidenzas that I have. I don't have five fidenzas total, but those three are the ones that I have hanging together. I just went into the the details of your spiral. It's pretty cool that Brinkman is the one who minted it, and you're yeah. able to acquire it from him. But that's it's beautiful. Thank you. We're going to transition a little bit into the rapid fire of more like life type of questions. Uh, Is there one book that you would uh, recommend for max value to the reader? Uh, There's two that have really played a very, very big role in my life and they're very different. So if you don't, I know you asked for one, but if you don't mind, I'd like to mention the two of them. The first one is called Human Action, which is, was written by Ludwig von Mises, which is, where my name is derived from. And while not an easy read, it does really lay out the fundamental premises of Austrian school economics and libertarianism. So for me, while a challenging read, uh, it's added quite a bit and helped shape my, my view of the world and changed the way I perceived the world in a very big way. The second one, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to bring up only because this person is actually very, very negative on crypto and NFTs, but he's one of the greatest thinkers. And I just think that he's not looking at this particular aspect correctly, but it's Nassim Taleb. And the book is called The Black Swan. And that book came out in 2000, I think it was 2007. And it really, really changed my views of the of how markets act at a, at really at the right time, because as most people who study finance know we head into a very, very steep and challenging time shortly thereafter with the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. And a lot of what Nassim Taleb talked about in the black swan was extremely on point for what was about to happen and really allowed me to make a lot of changes in my life to, to that served me quite well in the very short future, like almost immediately pay dividends. So Nassim Taleb, to me, is one of the great financial minds. I, I do think he has it wrong on crypto, but Fooled by Randomness and The Black Swan are two books that he wrote that are both just phenomenal reads, in my opinion. Yeah. And in your interview with Scaly Nelson, I probably mispronounced mm-hmm. that, so you can edit that out too. But the, you know, you mentioned the the crack up boom from Von yeah. Mises. And it's, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's something I've believed in for a long time and I'll have to go back and revisit the read myself because uh, I'm hopefully getting some more free time. So thank you for sharing those. Those are you know, definitely amazing recommendations for anybody who, who has the time and the, uh, the persistence to get through it. Do you have a motto that you live by? Well, I, I said it before, uh, which is something that uh, having spent time in the financial markets is something that you really need to understand is that nobody ever lost money taking a profit. And, uh, you know, when you in general, when I'm making a bet or making an investment or putting a trade on, I typically will do it in bigger size than, um, you know, I might want to have long term. And the reason is that so that when you have the move that you want to have or you perceive as happening, you're able to sell some of what you have. I mean, having been so aggressive with art blocks, as this market started really taking off and really, you know, going into stratospheric type levels, you know, I was able to sell into that strength because I had such a big position in it that, you know, I I sold quite a bit, but yet I still have a giant art blocks position. That was one of the, one of the things that I think is very important. That if you don't ever take profits, you can put yourself in a very dangerous spot and round trip an entire trade, and then you know not have anything left over. The money that I was able to to take out, I then was able to buy on the way back down again and put that money back in and buy other things and diversify the holdings and helps you sustain in a bear market to be still be here and be fighting and be looking forward to the future and be well positioned. Yeah, no, you do, you've done a, a great job of that. Um, for anybody interested, I'm sure you can go on the blockchain and do all the investigative uh, detective on, on when and where, but you, you've done an amazing job, even so much so with rotating some of that into outside of art blocks. I know you're an early adopter of X and correct me if I'm wrong, but you have a lost Robbie too, correct? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, there, there's really amazing, uh, rotation and, and vision and foresight that you've had. Thank now, you. 
you've had a lot of success, not only in, in the NFT world, uh, but also in your, your personal life. I guess my question is, how do you define success and has this changed over time? I think success will ultimately be creating a legacy that um, you know persists long after I'm gone. I, I think one of the things that's really amazing about blockchain and what I really love is and like you just alluded to, Jared, like what I like about blockchain is if you want to check what kind of job I've done, well, go have at it, man. Knock yourself out. You can look it all up. Every trade I've ever done is in real time right there on a blockchain. And I'm proud of that record. Uh, I, I like the fact that, you know, a hundred years from now, some internet, some blockchain sleuth will be, you know, going through early art blocks and be like, wow, this is Von Mises guy, Jesus. You know, like, I think that's cool. And I, I, I'm trying to create that bond with my daughter because I hope someday, you know, she takes over the Von Mises name or Von Mises brand. And, you know, if she wants to, if it's not what she wants, that's fine also. But I, I, I want to have this legacy and I want that to persist. And I think success is that for me, I, I feel like success will be in 50 years or 100 years. You know, maybe someone's still talking about Von Mises or someone says, oh, that guy was a great collector or that guy really, you know, made a mark on this space and really laid the groundwork for everything that came after it. And I don't know if that's going to happen or that's ridiculous or that's crazy. But if you ask, like, what defines success? I don't think it's money. I don't think it's followers. I don't think it's anything like that. I think it's really more about the legacy and what you leave behind and ultimately how you're perceived in the future. Yeah, your ability to for inclusiveness is something that I think is going to go down as part of your legacy, not only with your daughter, which I think is really admirable. I do the same thing with my two sons, but just as a general uh, community advocate, uh, you're very generous. And, um, you know, I definitely think that if it, if somebody would not already say that you're, you're successful in that sense, uh, you're definitely setting the foundations for that. Thank you. Um, so from two collectors on this side of things. Uh, thank you for, for all that you are doing. Uh, Appreciate it. How do you filter for opportunities? Cause you've been so good at finding these early on. It's a good question. Uh, it, it's hard, especially now that, you know, I have a lot more demands on my time. I'm monitoring a lot more things. It's, it's definitely harder in general. I, you know, one of the advantages to what we talked about earlier when you cultivate a following uh, of people, a lot of people will want to pay you back. And not that I have any expectations of being paid back, but a lot of people will say, hey, uh, Vaughn, I know you're busy. Did you happen to take a look at this? And if it's someone that I have a good relationship with, I'm gonna look at that project. And, you know, I, I think that's one of the things that like, it's a, it's a, unexpected benefit you when when you help people they want to help you back and so a lot of times people will bring me ideas sometimes they're not worth it but you know for every 10 ideas someone brings people bring me there's one or two gems in there and that's really what it's about because sometimes it is hard to filter through all the noise and all the bullshit especially when the market was a lot hotter it was hard to follow things so uh, you know i i do rely on people that i have helped and you know, like sometimes there'll, there'll be there'll be someone that I helped and they get really into, you know, Zed horse racing or they get very into axes. And then that person, when I when I need an update, I can say, hey, I know you're a lot more focused on axes than I am. You know, is there anything I should know about or what do you think of this stuff that I own or anything? And they'll, they're they're very willing to help because when they were starting off, I was willing to help them. And I think that's really what it's about. I think that's also something that people miss. So when you help other people, you do you do get that back. Um, you know, it's not why you do it, but it, it is one of the added benefits. Yeah, I think you you know through life experiences too. You've you've gotten um, I, I think a really good BS meter and just even the the indication that of, of somebody's personality like Eric and latching on and, and wanting to support good people. It's uh you know I I, I can't uh, under emphasize the. The importance of like you know time in the space, time in the seat, reps, whatever you want to call it. Uh, not to discount anybody in the space, but I just think that you know you learn from those uh, before you, and 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 you're doing a, yep. a phenomenal job showing people how to how to navigate that space, and and really, in my opinion, just through your actions, look at some of those opportunities. In the interest of time, because I know we're getting close to to the end. 
for you, what's the best advice that you've received uh, in the NFT space? Uh, you know, do your own due diligence would be the first thing. Recognize that there are a lot of people in the space that are not looking out for you. Uh, so really who you follow and who you trust and who you take advice from, because there are lots and lots of people in the space that will take advantage of people. And so it's really about trying to understand people's motivations and understanding that not everyone is going to do the right thing. In fact, I, I would say most people will not do the right thing, but there are, a, a, there is a very large number of people that will do the right thing. And those are the people that you really want to focus on and follow the people that are out there, you know, pound, sending out a hundred messages a day on a shit coin. Those are not people you want to follow. Those people are absolutely the most lowest form of self-serving scumbags. Uh, you, you know, I don't, I'm not going to name any names, but it shouldn't be too hard to figure, figure out who some of these people are. hundred percent agree. There's it's part of what gives me so much conviction in this space that there's so many good people. And if you can align yourself with, with the good people, I think on a long enough timeline, good things happen. Um, I know I've asked you to, to narrow stuff down to one things, uh, one book, one, one word for Snowfro, but do you have a, what real quick, what are some of your highlights from your collection? I, I uh, the last selfie by X copy is one that I really love. I think that's a true classic. Uh, one of my favorite X copy pieces, although I have quite a bit of X copy. Um, that one is definitely my favorite. Uh, a, a lot of just the a lot of the early squiggles, like the the two um, hyper rainbows minted consecutively, the perfect spectrums I have left. Uh, I'm just trying to think of. Uh, 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 of other art blocks pieces and other stuff. I mean, obviously my zombie crypto punk, my cowboy crypto punk, my beanie crypto punk, the pilot helmet crypto punk, my Fidenzas. These are things that are, you know, very dear to me. Uh, Meridians, the ringers, you know, I minted, I think I minted 18 ringers and I still have eight left and I love them. Uh, you know, the gazers that I have in my collection, I, I really love. Uh, I, I know I'm missing, I'm, I'm forgetting tons of the lost Robbie stuff. That's like historically significant. The autoglyphs, autoglyphs I have in my collection. Very, very important to me. Uh, you know, I do like my, my board ABI club, although I'm hesitant to put it in the same, same level as the other stuff, but I do like it. The death beef stuff. Oh, the stuff, the, the one that, the, the one piece that I've been using, as my the banner on my Twitter is by is fly swatter by Dan Gies. I think that piece is just spectacular. I love the color. I love the vibe from it. You know, the cyberpunk DJ sitting at his computer with his gun next to him. Like, I just love that piece a lot. Uh, th those are those are kind of some of the highlights I would I would I would sum up in my collection. Yeah, and I would I would add to that you have a really beautiful guide one night anti cyclone. Yes. Your ringers are off the hook, and then I really because I'm part of this crowd. I love your rose palette screens, and then your newsprint meridians. I think oh nice, I just, nice, yeah. I enjoy scrolling through your collection for anybody who's interested. Uh, it's just it's a really great capture of a moment in time and what uh, you know what a great eye could represent. So. And, and those are just of the some of the highlights of the collection. So if someone wasn't aware of what misses, you can get the idea of the quality of the collection he has. He hasn't even mentioned the spiral fidenza, which probably is the top, one of the top fidenzas in the collection. So it's uh, incredible, truly a historical collection, what misses. Thank you, thank you. It's it's been an honor to build it, and I like I said, it's all about building a legacy for me. So. On that note, do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with the listenership? Um, the only thing I'd say is I think that if you're listening to this podcast and you've gotten this far in it, you are in the right place at the right time. And don't listen to the people that are telling you it's a scam or NFTs are a joke. The ability for people to transact in a trustless manner is for the first time in human history allowed to happen. Uh, don't underestimate the value and the power of that. We have a financial system that, that basically still functions the way it was created 100 years ago using trusted intermediaries that introduces centralization risk, 
It introduces counterparty risk. Before blockchain, there was no other way to do things. But now that we have blockchain, it's a whole new world. What I would say to you when it comes to NFTs, the world is full of fakes and forgeries and altered pieces of art and collectibles. Um, NFTs are the only form of art or collectible that has unquestionable provenance and provable scarcity. And these are two qualities you cannot get in the real world. They're not going away. It's, it's, it's only going to get built on because you can't buy a Rolex, an old Rolex watch, or you can't buy uh, a, a Warhol without having to really wonder whether it's legit or not. There's so many fakes and forgeries. And the beautiful thing is that in a hundred years, a 15 year old with an internet connection is gonna be able to look at a CryptoPunk or a Fidenza or an Autoglyph and say with 100% certainty, this is real. This is not something you can do today with anything that's more than 10 years old. So believe me, the underpinnings of this technology are extraordinarily valuable. And I do not think the world is even close to understanding how important it is. I love the conviction and I don't think any truer words could have been spoken. Um, I 100% agree with you. The the provenance, the the verifiability, and just the fact that we're we're super early, Vaughn. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. I can't thank you enough for for sharing your journey, some of your insights. There's a lot of gems that came out of this. So uh, on behalf of Squiggledell, Nifty, and myself, uh, truly, truly grateful for your time. If you're intrigued by anything that has been said today, uh, you can follow. Uh, Vaughn at Vaughn Mises 14 on Twitter. Are there any other uh, places that anybody can follow you on? Uh, I'm on DECA also. Vaughn Mises on DECA. Uh, you can, um, that, yeah, I would say uh, DECA and um, Twitter are the two places where you'd be most likely to, you know, come across my name or be able to learn more about what I'm doing. By the way, I also want to thank you guys for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Nice to talk about Swiggles and the journey and everything in the space. And I appreciate all that you guys are doing as well. Well, thank you. Uh, it thank it, you so it much, really man. is a, a true pleasure. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for for hopping on. Uh, for anybody interested, you can follow the Squiggle Dow on Twitter. Uh, join the Discord. There is a free section in there where anybody can jump in and get advice from absolute uh, maniacs with squiggle knowledge such as nifty and others so please feel free to join we would love to talk to you talk about anything squiggle related or the nft space for that fact so thank you everyone for listening like follow retweet do all the good stuff uh thank you again Vaughn. truly appreciate it all right guys thank you very much the information provided in this podcast is for general informational purposes only and should not be considered as professional or financial advice. The hosts and guests are not licensed financial advisors, accountants, or lawyers. The content is based on personal experiences, opinions, and research, and its accuracy, completeness, and timeliness cannot be guaranteed. 